So hello, I am Lilia Perez. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Grants and Programs Manager at Artsmith Hudson. I'm also a, uh, an artist. I got my BFA in photography from SUNY New Paltz. Um, so my background is mainly in uh, photography and doing, you know, artistic work on the computer. And um, I manage our grants program. So I see a lot of um, work samples come across, you know, through my work. And I also manage our gallery program. So I help people apply to calls for art there as well. And so today um, we're going to go over a lot of technical stuff having to do with submitting uh, artwork samples for um, both calls for art and for grant applications. And uh, I'm also just going to offer my tips and my experience, um, you know, seeing these work samples be reviewed and being seen by others uh, that, you know, make up these either the curators or the panels that are determining grants. Uh, so I'm going to go over, you know, some of my tips around selecting work samples, some of my tips around hiring professional photographers, um, photographing your artwork, editing photos of artwork. I'm going to do some technical, give some technical information about file types and image resolution because that comes up a lot. And then just my final tips on getting yourself organized and how to actually prepare for your submission. I think before we get started, since we're a smaller group, actually, and I'll pause the record, the, or can I pause the recording? No, um, it would be great if anybody here just wants to unmute themselves and say, like, if there's something they really are looking to get out of this particular workshop. You know, if there's any anything that you really want me to maybe add some extra information on, or just if anyone wants to share their purpose, what they're trying to gain today. And you can put it in the chat too, if that's easier. And I'll pause for a minute. If, if nobody is ready to share anything, that's fine. We can keep going. It's helpful for me to know if there's anything, you know, extra info I can add or any specific needs. All sounds useful. For me, whatever, for me, the stuff you're, that you have listed is pretty much what I was looking for, mostly with um, the image files and resolutions and, mm -hmm. and the actual artwork, you know, if there's spe specific ways that it should be photographed, especially if it's three-dimensional. Okay, good to know. Good. Anyone else? Okay, then we'll get started. And just so you know, also there's some stuff in here uh, that um, is gonna you know, appear a little bit small, there are examples. This will also be shared to you. Uh, I'll share a PDF of this with all of you after. So you have all of the information um, and you have all of the image examples to see. Okay, great. And Susan said, yeah, you're looking for an overview. Great. Okay. So first of all, go over what is the value of a strong work sample? And I like to start talking about this because I think um, this really goes for any submission process, whether you're applying to a job or you're applying to a call for art or you're applying for you know, a, a grant. Um, I think we can sometimes forget that if you're submitting visual work samples, that is the only visual representation that the person on the other side has will have to experience your work. We can't assume that they know anything about you or about your work, about how your work typically looks in person. Um, they are now tasked with um, understanding and experiencing your work through a screen, most likely. It's very, you know, maybe that's going to be projected on on a on a projector screen at a meeting or maybe they're going to be viewing it on their computer they're they're very unlikely to actually be printing them out um, so the way it appears on the screen is the only visual you want to you know tell yourself this is the only thing they're going to see of my work um, and I think it's important just to remind ourselves that when we're starting to talk about this and the other side of this is that your work sample needs to support your words and so this goes for your artist statement, um, even your, your bio, um, what you're laying out that you would do or what you would create in a grant application if you were to be funded. Um, you'll hear me talk about this a lot, but any information, oh, thank you. Thank you to whoever um, enabled closed captioning. I intended to do that. Thank you so much. Um, is it working for everybody? 
the closed captioning. You can see me. Let me. Uh, Okay, it says it's already enabled, so I can't enable it again. It's just on the, um, uh, under the show captions, uh, the little arrow, you can put it to uh, the full transcript. I just turned it on. Okay, great. All right, so, um, sorry, lost my train of thought there. So um, your work sample needs to support your words. So what's important is that, um, you know, oh, let me take a step back. When these are being reviewed, um, they're going to be, it's, it's great if you are able to glean any information from the funder or the organization about how your art will, will be viewed how the application or the submission will be viewed. You can pretty much always assume that it's going to be displayed in the order that you're entering it into the form. So in some cases, they're gonna ask for your work sample first and then read your writing. But in most cases, they're gonna read your writing first and then they're gonna see your work samples. So I hear remarked often, whether I'm working with curators or I'm working with panelists on a grant review, um, pa grant panel um, that, oh, I read their, their artist statement and their bio and I got to the work and it did not support what I actually read. It didn't reflect what I had just read. Um, and so these two components, your writing and your work sample, if they're requesting writing, really go hand in hand and should support one another. Um, because that's what that's there's nothing more disappointing than than a panelist or a curator getting to the work sample and saying, this was not reflected in what I just read. The vision, you know, the vision they were laying out in the writing just is not reflected or is not what I'm getting from the work sample itself. When you're selecting work samples, um, as I've alluded to, unless you're a photographer, you are now tasked with presenting your work in an entirely new format. Right? You're asked to take your painting and put it into a photo, or take your um, your choreographed dance and put it into a video. And so you are really changing the medium that they're going to experience your work. And so it's really important to think about whether video or uh, photos, if you're allowed to submit photos, both work samples could be used to your advantage to really communicate the experience of seeing your work in person um, and engaging with your work. Um, and so just, this is why we're doing this workshop today, to give you some basic, really photography computer skills so that you can um, utilize that to present your work well. A common comment I hear, um, and you know, a lot of the advice I'm gonna give about working with curators and working with panelists, it is so subjective from person to person, what they think is your best work or what they think is engaging work. Um, and, uh, for that reason, it, it can be really hard to select your own work samples because you're trying to consider what a person who you may not know at all or a group of people who you don't even know who they are, are going to really um, be enticed by and be interested in. So what I often hear from panelists though, is this comment that I just think it's funny how often I hear it, that they say, oh, and they knew to put their strongest work first, or um, they, I wish they had put their strongest work first. This is a really difficult thing for you to understand about yourself, but if you are able to achieve this and put your quote unquote strongest work first, I've noticed it have a real impact on the person on the other end seeing it. And I think the only way to get towards this is by seeking feedback from others having feedback with other artists, with curators that you know, trying to understand um, going into the next point that you might not be choosing your best work, your favorite work, or the greatest range of work. You're trying to select the most compelling example of your work or your strongest work. And that order matters. The order that they see them in can often make a difference on how they experience and how they come to understand your work. So um, thinking about Again, I would, I think it's safe to assume in most situations that the order you upload your images in or the order you see them in the submission is the order that the curator or panelist is going to see your work in. And thinking about that order becomes important. My other tip when selecting work samples, so definitely you want to use recent and relevant work. And so, um, Given our current um, reality of still um, 
living through a pandemic. I, I usually I would say a shorter span would be more appropriate work within one to two years, depending on what you're doing. I think you could even go as far back as 2019 if you're trying to represent a body of work that took place in a different era or just make sure you keep yourself muted. Sorry. Um, thanks. Um, you know, if you're trying to represent uh, community engaged work that you really haven't been able to do since 2019. And now you're trying to return to that. That would be an appropriate situation, right? But in most cases, I think it's really important to keep it to work that has been created within the past one to two years and is really relevant to either the theme or the call for submission, obviously, in those situations. But then also, if you're submitting a grant proposal, you hear me actually talk about this on the next slide, um, that the work is relevant to what you will be doing if you are uh, awarded a grant. And as I alluded to before as well, it's if you can glean any information about what the review process will be for work samples, that is really invaluable for your, you know, being strategic around what you're going to include and what you're going to present. So uh, who is making the selections, understanding and looking at, okay, so this curator and the artistic director of the organization are going to be making the selections and going back and looking at some of the things that that curator has curated, artists that they have been, um, you know, engaged with previously, um, looking at the, if the gallery has any kind of history of the work they've shown previously, that can be helpful. Um, and then how it will be reviewed. For example, there, I don't like to name the exact organization anymore because I don't know if they still do this, but I used to be aware of an organization that they accepted, um, Four, uh, 12 work samples for their, it was a big grant award, and they would always be viewed on three slides. So they would be presented in the order that you uploaded them, the first four on one slide, the next four on the next slide, then the last four on the last slide. And so if you know that your work is going to be grouped in that way, that impacts the order that you put them in. And the, so if they, if, if any organization, gallery, funder is offering assistance or offering the ability to talk to them. Um, it's great to try to get them on the phone and, and just ask, you know, can you tell me anything about how my work will be reviewed or the format will be reviewed? And of course, any guidelines or, or help text that they're giving you when submitting is also really important so that, you know, you've at least read what they've asked you to read and what they've put out there. And then you can ask more questions of them if you're able to chat with them. But of course, we know that is not always the case. So as I've been saying, I would assume that the first one you upload, and that's the order that it's that they're going to be viewed in. So now some more tips just around work samples for grant or funding requests. So as I said before, work samples have to support your words. And this is really um, especially critical for grant funding requests because so much of it is the writing um, and so much of it is laying out potential plans and activities that you'll do if you are to receive funding. And so, it, again, they want to get to the work sample and see it all click for them that this is possible, that they can envision how the work will um, align with what you've laid out to do. Again, I'll repeat again, use recent and relevant work is, is just as important for submission for galleries as it is or for like, a, you know, a performing arts for festivals um, or for performances as it is for grant funding requests. If you're applying for a grant to create new work, uh, then you want to think carefully about the work samples you're using. This is a um, it's a difficult position to be in. It's, you know, right now, I'll say all of you should know that we have the statewide community regrant program is available and accepting submissions. And one of the categories within that program is the individual artist commission, which funds the creation of new work during the calendar year. And so that's one of the many questions I get, you know, a very common question is, um, how can, uh, what work sample do I submit for something that I haven't done yet? And you're looking at what is relevant and related in terms of, first of all, that it's recent work, um, that maybe it's connected thematically to the work that you're going to do or an expansion of work that you will be doing. If it's not connected thematically, maybe it's connected uh, by medium and you can show your facility within a medium and your previous work within that medium. Um, I would say if you're an artist who maybe you do a majority oil painting and you're proposing a grant for um, drawing that you're going to be doing um, pencil drawing, that would be a situation where you don't want to just include 
images of oil painting, even though that might be your stronger work. It can even be dangerous to include any samples of another medium. I've actually noticed that some panelists will say, like, I really actually prefer their work in oil. And you've kind of given them the ability to go down that train of thought. So I would keep it focused as, and as relevant as possible to what you are planning to do. Um, find out how the funding recommendations are made. So same thing as trying to find out how your work will be viewed. If you can gather any information on how they, you know, what the review process is like, that's really important to be able to think strategically about what you're going to put forth. If they enable you to include a descriptive list of your submissions, that's great. Sometimes instead they'll have a section where you can just write notes about your work samples, um, or there's not going to be anything. And, and then, um, you know, some work requires or would benefit from a little bit of a context around what that work is. Um, and especially things like what the medium is and what the size is, if they're not asking for those things, if there's any way to slip it in, it could be helpful to them. Um, and if they are asking for it, sometimes they'll say, uh, please include a list uh, notes on uh, your submissions here and please include uh, title, date, size and medium. Um, if you do that and you leave out all the sizes, you know, like they've kind of left it up to you to make sure that you're hitting all those things. So you want to read any instructions very carefully to make sure that you're including everything they've asked of you. Size is a big one. That one comes up a lot where panel, you know, a courier will say, well, they haven't included the size and I don't know if this is three inches or three feet, you know, and it can be really difficult to tell in a, in a digital image. Um, and if you can include a, a descriptive list, I'll show you actually at the very end, I have an example of, of one of those lists or like kind of a contact sheet you could include. Um, yes. And then my last tip around here is uh, if you are able to include video, that's a really powerful work sample. If you have any documentation of your artistic practice, especially if you do community engaged work, um, or if you have three-dimensional work, um, or of course, if you have time-based work, like uh, of course video, right? Or if you're a dancer or a performing artist or um, you know musician, those kinds of things, you know, especially for something where seeing it and seeing the movement or hearing the sound is really important. You're not gonna wanna rely on just photos of yourself performing or photos of yourself dancing. Video is really critical. Any questions around some of these tips I've given or thoughts before I keep going? Okay. All right, so now we're gonna get into kind of my photography 101 type of stuff and just introducing you to some um, photography terms and ways of using cameras. So I'd like to start off talking about this first by talking about what it would mean to, you know, weighing the pros and cons of photographing it yourself and investing in the equipment and software needed to do that or hiring a professional. So first of all, consider what are you trying to achieve with your work samples? Are you trying to go for a $50,000 massive grant? I would think then it would be worth the investment of some stronger, you know, work samples, at least a couple that have been photographed by a professional photographer. Um, or are you trying to do some, uh, you're really just getting started, you don't have a budget, um, and you just want to get your work out there and do some local shows, then I would think of what are some cost effective ways, especially if you're on a budget that you could try to do this yourself. And maybe if you have one piece that is really could, you know, you really want to show off, you really want to get shown, and you're going to invest in getting one piece professionally photographed. Um, what equipment and software do you already have access to? Have you identified any resources to use equipment or software if you don't have access to it yourself? I'll actually throw out there that Center for Photography at Woodstock. They have a digital lab that uh, they're based in Kingston now. Actually, I think they're changing their name to Center of Photography at Kingston, or I don't know what they're going to do about that. But um, they're a great organization. They have a digital lab. They have scanners. They have printers. Um, they have assistance there and you pay like an hourly fee to use one of their computers and use Photoshop, for example, or use um, Premiere or, or Bridge or whatever it might be um, or Lightroom. Uh, if you, you know, when you want to start this, I think it's, you know, I'm going to try and 
lay out all of the different components that you would need to, to budget for, but take a look and say, to figure out, you know, if I'm going to do this myself, this is everything I need. How much is that going to cost me instead of, okay, I'm going to buy the camera. And then you realize you need to buy a tripod and lights and other things that you didn't budget for, you know, so try to think about the whole picture of everything you're going to need and then establish what is your budget for this? What can you really invest in these work samples? So I'll go over some pros and, and I really only have one con of hiring a professional photographer. And I'll say it first, it, that it's, it can be expensive and it cannot be sustainable as you continue to produce work, that you have to continue to get your new work photographed by a photographer. Um, that's really the only con in my eyes because um, if you're working with somebody who is a professional art photographer, they are going to offer a lot in terms of what you're able to, to get out of those images. So I'll say, first of all, professional art photographers have specialized skills in reducing glare, in lighting unique objects, in reproducing colors accurately. And I'll also say that not all photographers have these skills, right? So not every photographer, just because you, you know, have a friend who does wedding photography, that doesn't necessarily immediately translate to them being really good at photographing a ceramic piece in a studio. Um, it's a, you know, related skill set, but it's not completely interchangeable. So the best, you know, use of your money is to really find someone who has, pro does professional art photography um, and uh, can show you examples of what they've done. Uh, it also allows you to establish a relationship with a photographer and, you know, work, you know, and I think another con potentially you might think, oh, I'll have more control over it if I do it myself, which is certainly true, but you could also learn a lot from a professional photographer if you're working with them and work with them closely to get what you want. You know, it's not like you're going to drop off your work and not be there. You'll probably be there with them working and can say, well, can we, can we try to get an image like this and be able to describe something to them? And that's part of a lot of the photography information I'm about to give you is not only so you understand the terms in case you want to do it yourself, but so that you have the vocabulary and the base knowledge to be able to talk to a photographer if you're working with them. And I've included a list of questions that I would ask a, a professional videographer or photographer if I were to work with them. So of course, you want to establish how much do they charge? And do they charge by the hour or do they charge by the piece? Um, because some art photographers, they, they might be either option. And then does this fee include image processing? So for example, if they're going to charge you by the hour and you're going to do a two hour session, but they're also going to do image processing after, which might take them an additional two hours, meaning they're going to color correct the images. Um, it, they, you might not realize that it's actually more hours than you initially think, right? So make sure that you understand what are the total hours they're going to need and what's the hourly rate, or if they're charging by piece, is it just one lumped in thing? They're not thinking about the hours they're just saying to get the fully final, you know, uh, realized image of this piece, it's going to be this amount. Um, and also asking if it includes image processing, because some of them may not, they might just, they might do very minimal image processing and they're going to be expecting you to, to pick it up from there. You're going to want to ask for an estimate, obviously, of the totality of what you're trying to do. And then if you're on a budget, you know, work with them, especially a lot of these people who are working in this field are artists themselves, and they might be able to um, do something on a smaller scale if you say, I can only, I only have $200 to vote for this. Like, what can you do for me for $200? And maybe that would be just the session itself, but no image processing or something like that. Find out um, what format the photographer will be, will be shooting in and what format you'll receive the files in. So that's one of the big technical things I'm going to talk about in a big a bit is what the difference is between different file sizes and different file types. Um, but, you know, it's important to know what they're going to be working in and what they're going to give it to you in. If they're a professional art photographer and they're using a full lighting setup, I would be very surprised if they are shooting in anything other than raw image. Um, I'll talk a bit about raw and what that means later on, but I would expect them to be shooting in raw. That does not mean that they're necessarily going to give you the file in a raw format and you might not want in a file, a raw format. So. If I was working with someone, I would want to know that they're working in raw, but they're like, they're able to give it to me in multiple formats if I ask for it and that they're likely to send it to me in a JPEG. 
go over all this a bit more and I'll try to come back to this when we get there. Ask what the turnaround time is, especially if you're on a deadline for a specific submission. This is the kind of thing that if you're going to work with a photographer, I would not recommend doing it, you know, under a huge time constraint. This is something to think about in advance and prepare yourself for maybe a year of submissions that you're going to make. And then try to see some samples of their previous work and see if it aligns with what, you know, what you're trying to capture. Because there, there's a lot of ways to dynamically capture work, especially three-dimensional work, especially if you're working with a videographer. Um, I'll take a step back and say, you know, the same thing applies for um, what format the videographer is going to be working in, what they're going to give you that in. Um, that's important to understand. Okay. Any questions about working with professional photographers? Okay, great. So now I'm going to talk a bit about cameras. Um, and so I'll start off by saying uh, a DSLR camera, which um, would be great. Actually, if you give me a second, I can hold mine up in the screen. One second. So DSLR cameras are these giant cameras, right? Big camera, big lens. Um, this is uh, a professional camera. I have it because I'm, I do photography. Not every photographer has a camera like that. Um, this is not something that you all need to go out and get. If you're just getting started with photography, this is something that you would go out and get if you're planning to do it professionally. Um, and as, even if you're trying to use it at, to generate business, to, to you know, um, make some income on using it. Um, it's preferred. It's definitely preferred. I would want to see a professional I'm paying using a camera like that. Um, but if you're doing it on your own, you can create a decent image with something as simple as a smartphone, especially some of the newer smartphones um, or even smartphones within the past four or so years. Um, and a good in-between are called digital compact or mirrorless cameras. They can cost a, under, it might even be a little less these days, but I don't know because of that computer chip shortage if it's still impacting uh, cameras, but around $350 and even better if you wait for a holiday or you wait for when there's a big sale, you can always get deals on those kinds of compact cameras. And when you're selecting a camera, you want to pay attention to the camera sensor size and megapixel count. And I'm going to explain that on the next slide. And that to say, you do not need the necessarily need the highest amount. It's about figuring out what is within your budget and what has the best, uh, the largest sensor size and highest megapixel count for what you know is necessary for you and for your budget. When you're, if you're going to get a camera, or even if you're going to use your smartphone to photograph your work, uh, it's really important to have a tripod. I recommend if you are planning to use your phone and use a camera or want to have the option to be able to use um, both, they make a lot of tripods now that have a, um, you know, the regular tripod plate that goes in that you screw the camera in. And then they might also have something like the handle opens up and becomes a little clasp that holds your phone as well. And is a tripod for your phone. You can also get mounts for your phone that screw into that tripod plate. Um, but if you're going to do this yourself, you definitely want to get a tripod. Um, you want to make sure the tripod can handle the weight of whatever you're going to put on it. So that's something you can check in the specs for the tripod. Um, and it's important because you want a completely unblurred, stable image. And especially if you're working with lights, that becomes important that you want the camera to stay completely still. And of course, if you're going to be doing videography or if, um, um, you know, if you're going to be doing videography, remember, it's it sounds obvious, but remember to shoot like this, right? And not like this so that you can easily upload it and it's not going to be viewed in a vertical format. Um, and uh, you can capture some pretty good video with your phone um, and uh, if you have a smartphone. Uh, and if not, looking at when you're looking at one of these digital cameras, seeing you know what video it outputs, what video type it out, uh, what video file type it outputs, uh, and that making sure it has a video feature. You know, you might be able to get a uh, photo uh, uh, camera that takes photos that also takes video. 
when you're working with your camera, if you have experience using um, different uh, understanding, and I'm going to talk about all these things in a couple minutes, ISO, shutter speed, f-stops, white balance, then you would want to shoot in manual. If you're, if you're interested in learning about photography and you want to try and take advantage of these things, you have a lot more control over the image when you're in manual mode and you're adjusting all of these things yourself. And it's, it allows you to continue to work and adjust, you know, take an image, take a look at it and then make some adjustments and then take another. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with this, shoot in auto mode and that's totally fine. There's no shame in doing that, especially if you don't wanna mess with this stuff and you, you trust the camera more. Um, and uh, on that note, a lot of cameras have, um, I don't know if you can see it, it's not gonna be good, but they'll have like an auto mode. It'll say auto usually like in green or something. And then they'll have a, a, an auto mode that has like, it's a, it's just a circle with the flash symbol with a line through it. And that's saying it's also auto mode, but it will not use flash. Never use a compact flash. This, don't use this <laughs> on your on your images. It'll create a really bad glare. Um, it, it never looks good. It's, it's really for like snapshots with your, you know, if you're trying to take a quick snapshot with family or friends, that's the only time I use compact flash. Uh, it's definitely not appropriate for photographing artwork. It'll create one really bright spot on your image um, and will not distribute light evenly. Uh, so if you're going to use auto mode, make sure you're using the mode that is going to disable the compact flash. And my last tip is um, something we don't always think about, and I often forget, is do not rely on your display screen, you know, on your phone, on back of the camera, you know, the display screen that we have. Um, all of these screens are calibrated, uh, especially a, a display screen on the back of the camera, even a really good camera is compressed so that you can get a display preview in the camera. And often I'm looking at something and I'm like, oh, that looks like correctly exposed. It looks like the light is evenly distributed and there are no dark or light spots. And then I upload to the computer and I'm like, oh, it's really dark or, oh, it, it looked a lot more contrasty on my camera. But when I bring it in here, it's really dull. So that's why it's good to, especially if you're going to maybe say you're going to photograph yourself and you have a whole setup, you have your work on the wall, you have your light set up, you have your camera on a tripod. Um, and uh, you take some images, you know, take a few test images and then take the card out, take it over to your computer and just check and see what they look like on the computer. You don't need to check after every image, but just getting a baseline of understanding, okay, this is this is the output for what I did. Um, you'll see that it can, it will wildly differ from what was on your display screen. So the last thing you wanna do is spend like two hours working, take all these photos and then realize, oh, if I had just checked this 10 minutes in, I could have adjusted whatever I needed to adjust. So this is one of those diagrams that will probably be more helpful to you later on when I send you the PDF of this information, but um, just some examples of sensor sizes and then thinking about what sensor size you actually need. So this is just like a visual representation of the difference between camera sizes. So this is usually kind of an old example. Um, I would imagine like the latest iPhone has a much bigger sensor than this. I actually don't know offhand what it is, um, but just the, the difference. So an iPhone has a, a quite a small sensor and um, a full frame DSLR camera, like the one I have has a sensor that's the size of this. And this is also, if anyone ever used 35 millimeter film, it's kind of the same size. It's that, it's literally that size within the camera. And the bigger the sensor, the more light, and you'll hear me say this later on, photographs are light. They are a capturing of light. So the bigger the sensor, the more light is able to reach the sensor, the more information it's able to um, take in. And so uh, that's why a lot of photographers like myself included still love using 35 millimeter uh, cameras because you can print the images bigger than a standard camera. Um, and you get a lot more information. Um, you know, if we remember using 35 millimeter film, it that size, you know, that's like a large sensor. It would be literally that size in a DSLR camera, something that a professional photographer would be using. Your phone has a much smaller one and it's still, you know, it's still able to take a pretty good image for that size. It's come a long way in the past five years. Um, now, in here, I won't use do go into this, but there are formulas that you could use to figure out 
how big a sensor you need to be able to print. Let's say you want to print an image. Say you did um, a painting and you want to photograph it so that you can create prints from it. Um, depending on, um, first of all, that kind of thing would be a really good thing to go to a professional art photographer for. But if you're going to try to do it on your own, you would think about, okay, so I need to print these 16 by 20. That impacts how big a sensor you need, because if you're using a very small sensor and you try to print it very large, bigger than the, the image can handle, it's going to appear very pixelated. It's not going to, you know, it's going to look blurry. You'll see literally squares within the image of the pixels, the colors making up the image. So um, there is a formula that you can use. It's it's written here. Uh, I can send it to you in text format. Maybe when I send this to you in PDF, I'll also just write the formula out so you can copy and paste it and, and have it and it's not contained within an image. Um, but basically you do a formula to figure out how based on the pixel size, the megapixels, how big it could be printed. So a small sensor, like a phone, you could probably print it around four and a half by six inches max. Um, and a camera like a DSLR camera with a full frame sensor, you could print 16 by 20. It's still not, you know, if you want to work really large scale, then, you know, it's getting more complicated. You need a really high quality camera or you need to really understand image processing so that you can um, work with the image and size it up and still maintain the integrity of the image. All right, now I'm gonna go over some basic camera terms. So the first really common is exposure. So that's how light or how dark an image is. Your exposure, how much light is exposed to the sensor, right? is controlled by aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. So now I'm gonna define these terms as well. All right, so aperture. Um, and I'll take a step back and say, um, you've heard the term DSLR camera. I used it before, it's, but this camera is here. Uh, it stands for digital single lens reflex. It literally means that there is a reflex happening. There's a, a mech, you probably hear it when you click the shutter on a camera, you hear something within the camera moving. It's the sensor. Um, and it's opening up to allow light into the camera. You've probably also seen, um, maybe I can scroll forward and show you. Did I include an image of an aperture? No. An aperture is um, how it's, it's basically a, a circle and it's how much, how big it opens and how much light is allowed to reach the sensor. So a very large window, they're measured in f-stops, aperture. They're called f-stops. So the large, a large window would be actually the smallest number, 1.8. That would be a very large opening. That would mean that the aperture for the camera is open like this big, okay? Like uh, this. Um, a small aperture, it would only be open like very, you know, very, very small, like maybe the size of a, if you're gonna punch a hole in a piece of paper with a hole puncher, like that small. This is a, how much light, how open the aperture is and how much light is going to come through the aperture and reach the sensor. And this also affects focus and I'll show you why in a moment. The other hand in hand, aperture and shutter speed go hand in hand. So shutter speed is the part of the camera, the shutter, how uh, that opens and closes to let light in to reach the sensor. And it's written in sec se uh, seconds or fraction of a second. So you might see like 200, 1, 200, or one inch, uh, I'm sorry, one, one second. Uh, that symbol here designates when you see it on a camera, it designates one second. The longer the shutter stays open, the more light can reach. So say I'm gonna have the, the, um, the shutter open for one 200th of a second, very short amount of time, right? The camera's going to like very quickly, the shutter is going to open and close, but I've have the um, f-stop. I have the aperture open all the way. So it's, it's allowing a lot of light in, but it's only going to be open for a short amount of time that depending on the situation that you're in, if you're maybe your daylight, that would be perfectly okay. You know, more than okay. Um, if you have a very short amount of time that the shutter is staying open and you also have a very small window of the aperture, the apertures that are, you know, very cl uh, closed, maybe it's F22, 
um, a very small window for the aperture, then very little light is able to reach because it's open for a short amount of time. And it's also very small, the amount that's letting in. Any questions about this? This is kind of like the core of, you know, like manual photography. And it's important to understand because even when you're shooting in auto mode, your camera is automatically deciding what it's going to do with these, these things. It's deciding based on, you know, it takes a little read of the light and then it decides, okay, the best way to do this would be uh, having the aperture open this much and having the shutter stay open for this long. So you'll see those things kind of flash on your camera if you're working with it. Um, one thing, iPhones, I don't know about Android, I don't know about Google Pixel, but iPhones completely hide this stuff from you. You don't have any, along with a lot of Apple products, you don't have any ability to control this kind of stuff. This is really for like a, you know, a compact camera or DSLR. Okay, the other piece of this is ISO. This determines how sensitive the camera sensor is going to be to light. You might remember these terms if you ever used 35 millimeter film, you know, there would be film speed 100, film speed 400, film speed 800. It's basically the same concept. It's how sensitive the sensor is to light. So if you're trying to, it also impacts how much detail is in the image. So if I'm shooting in a, uh, you know, little space I've set up, I have my painting on the wall, I have my lights and I have my camera on a tripod. I want to bring the ISO as far down to 100, as low as I could, because it's going to um, mean that uh, the image might take a second to take, for example, you know, the shutter might need to stay open for a second, but if everything's going to remain still, it's going to capture the most uh, information. It's the lowest sensitivity, but the highest level of detail. If I was taking a photo at night with my family um, and I, you know, didn't care too much how the, what the image quality came out, I just want to take a snapshot. Uh, I might bring the ISO up very high, something like 3,200, which will allow me to take a picture in a dark setting, but the images will, will appear kind of grainy. They'll have less detail. They might have that visual noise or little dots that you may have seen before, um, or even just like little specks of different colors, you know, like little, little specks of color. So if you're taking an image of your work, you want to have as low an ISO as possible. And that's mainly achieved usually through using a tripod because that's going to impact the shutter speed. Um, it's going to make it so that the camera has to stay open for longer or the shutter has to stay open for longer. And if you're holding it in your hand and the shutter speed is open for a second, your image is going to be totally blurry because even if you try to hold super still, you will inevitably shake a little bit, right? Okay, two other terms, and then I'm going to show you some examples of everything that I've just explained to you. So depth of field uh, is another term that's controlled by aperture. It's how much of the image is in focus. Um, so a very small aperture, um, uh, small f-stop number, 1.8, means the camera aperture is open really big, um, but wherever you have focused on in the image is going to be in focus and everything else will be blurred. And I'll show you an example of this in a second. A higher f-stop, meaning the, the aperture is very small, um, but uh, at more, nearly everything would be in focus. I'm actually gonna, I'll skip ahead to show you this because I know it's the next slide, example. So this is an aperture of 2.8. This means that the aperture is very wide. Uh, it's letting, allowing a lot more light in, but they have chosen this flower as a fixed focus point. So it's in focus and everything else behind it is out of focus. It's a really cool photographic tool that photographers use a lot. And it could be used, um, you know, I wouldn't go this extreme, you know, it, it gradually changes as you go up. You know, this is a high f-stop number. So all the flowers in the background are also in focus, right? Um, so if you're trying to fixate on a particular dynamic point on your work and, you know, maybe you're going to include one that kind of plays with depth of field a little bit and puts something out of focus, um, you could use that as a tool to try to create a dynamic image of your work. But in most cases, especially for something like a painting where you just want to get an even distribution of the detail of, of light, um, then I would choose a higher f-stop because it's going to put everything in the frame in focus or nearly everything. 
see if I have more examples. Now I'll go back to white balance. This is an example of shutter speed. So a shorter start, like very common examples of waterfall. If you're taking a picture of a waterfall and you want to see the drops of water, you would need to use a very short shutter, a very um, short duration that the shutter speed is open, very uh, a sixteenth of a second. You know, one uh, one. This is one uh, one sixty one sixtieth of a second. If you want to have kind of a blur effect on the waterfall, you would have the shutter speed open for longer and it would create a blur, a nice image of that waterfall. Um, if uh, that's, if anything in the frame moves, either way, I would imagine that this image had to have been taken on a tripod because not only, this is the only thing that's blurred, right? If I was holding in my hand, everything would be blurred, including the waterfall. And then this is an example of ISO. You can see, I hope you can see this on your screen. If not, take a look at it a little bigger when you get the PDF. But an, a lower ISO, there's just a consistency, a smoothness to the image. There's no grain, there's no noise. And when we get up to a higher ISO, you see that little bits of grain or specks all around. So that's why, especially if you're working in a controlled lighting situation, and you're indoors and you're on a tripod, there's no reason to have your camera set to a higher ISO because it's going to create noise whether you have the light there or not. And now I'm gonna take a step back and talk about white balance. So white balance is basically you telling your camera what white is based on the lighting situation. And Every camera has presets for this, and the presets are typically pretty good. You know, it'll say daylight or lights, uh, tungsten light bulbs, uh, meaning like everyday you know light bulbs. Um, um, might have shade. Shade is another common uh, auto white balance setting. Um, one thing you do not want to use is the auto white balance setting. If you use the auto white balance setting, it's going to do a white balance reading every single time you take a photo. And maybe a little shadow goes by or something changes and you end up with images. Like you'll see this a lot more if you're working outside or if you're um, you know, shoot, just taking photographs on your own that um, one image will be a little bit pink and one image will be a little bit green and one image will be a little bit blue and one will be right on, you know, but it's it's taking an individual reading each time. I think it's a lot easier to just set what I want the white balance to be and then all the images will be the same. And if I get the image and I say, oh, they're all a little pink, then I do the same adjustment for all of them instead of having to adjust for every individual image. So I recommend using one of the auto features for white balance. They usually work pretty good and they stay consistent. But if you want to set a custom white balance, um, I can send any of you a video on how to do that if you're interested. Uh, but you basically get a white sheet of paper, not one like this that has text on the other side, right? It's a blank sheet of paper. You hold it up in the frame, like if this is my frame for my picture, um, and you use the white balance feature to say, this is white in this lighting situation. This is um, uh, pure white in this lighting situation. And so that affects, it bases now everything this color, which is, as you can see in here, it's it's not perfectly white in the lighting situation. There's some shadows on it. Um, I have some weird fluorescent light bulbs up here that are creating kind of a yellowish look up here. So it will say, okay, the, they intend this to appear white in the image. So it will base every other color in the image off of that. That's why it's important. And that's why it creates color casts. It, control, it controls the colors in the image. Okay, any questions about these terms or photography stuff? Okay. So just some other tips about photographing your work. Again, a photograph is light. So what your light is key to the process. You're trying to distribute light as evenly as possible, especially for 2D work. Um, and I'm gonna show you some lighting setup examples in a moment. In your image, this is another reason why it's really good to get it off the camera and on the display screen on the camera, on your phone, look at it bigger on a monitor and take a look and see if there are any weird reflections, shadows, areas that are getting blown out, meaning they're too exposed, they're too bright. Um, and take advantage of any dynamic viewpoints, especially for three-dimensional work or for video work um, that you're you know, thinking about the perspective and where you're taking you know, the photograph or the video from. 
if you want to play, say you have a very textured canvas or you're a collage artist or you're a mixed media artist and you want to really highlight the texture of the piece, um, adjusting the position of the light a little bit will create a shadow, you know, on those little bits of detail. So it's a good thing to play around with. That's important to you. You're going to have your initial lighting set up and then you have room for experimentation just to kind of shift the lights a little bit to highlight any um, texture that you want to show. If you see any grain or noise in your image, if you're taking a digital image, that means that there is not enough light. The camera is doing something to compensate for the fact that there is not enough light. So that means that you either need to adjust your shutter speed, your ISO, your aperture, or just switch to an auto mode and give that a try. Um, uh, or check your, yeah, check your ISO is often the most, the most common culprit of that issue. There's a link here for um, photographing 2D work. And there's also uh, a video here on how to create an inexpensive light box, just using some pieces of paper and some, um, I won't click on them here. You can take a look at them later on your own. Um, but you, it, it is uh, shocking to me how easily you can create a, a, um, what's called a scrim, uh, a, just a seamless background or seamless, uh, excuse me, um, behind an image. So say you're taking a photo of this mug and uh, you want it to appear that just on a white background that you don't see the seams of the table or anything. You basically just take a white piece of paper um, and you put it at an angle like so and it will create the illusion of just nothing, just whiteness behind the image. And this video right here shows you how to build that, how to put some lights outside to diffuse the light and create a really inexpensive way to photograph two-dimensional work. Like you could do it, get all the stuff at the dollar store. All right, so I'll start here and say, this is an example of like what a professional photographer might do, right? A really complicated lighting setup. They have different types of lights. They have, um, you know, they're trying to highlight all aspects of the photo. This is the kind of thing you're getting if you're if you're working a professional photographer who does professional art photography. This is what you're hoping for. Maybe not this intense, uh, if not necessary, but they're especially for three dimensional work. This would be a really great way to shoot, um, unless of course they're using that seamless background. Then they might only have it lights up at the front. This is a really simple lighting setup that you could do at home, that you have your work up on a wall or on an easel, you have your camera, and then right beside it at 45 degree angles, you have the two lights pointing in at the piece. And the lights and the camera are same distance away from what you're using. Um, there are some inexpensive LED lights on, you know, online that you can purchase. Um, you know, B&H is a good source for photograph equipment, but it is expensive. I don't like to promote Amazon, but they often have very good deals on this kind of stuff if you're on a budget. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is um, a very simple method. And if you are even using, say you go down to a hardware store or Lowe's or something, and you pick up just a light bulb and a little light hole, you know, light bulb that's a holder that's going to hold it. And if you go ahead and just use the straight light bulbs on it, you'll see that they are, might be too harsh and create a glare on the image. You can use tracing paper or even white paper in front of the light to diffuse it. Uh, just be careful because you don't want to start a fire, right? <laughs> so just make sure you're keeping it, you know, maybe you have like another little stand or you hang a little piece of paper, a little thing from the ceiling or something just to diffuse the light um, or use tissue paper or something like that. So I'm going to talk about some common terms for editing photos. So I'm just going to put them all up here and talk about them. So first of all, um, you know, you are going to need to do, if you're taking the photographs yourself, you're going to have to do some image processing on the other end and edit, do a little editing on your photographs. And there are lots of free programs to do this. Um, I think it's my tip on the same slide. Um, obviously, you could do edits like this on um, Photoshop, Lightroom, um, which are Adobe products. 
they are charged monthly. You have to pay a monthly fee. So maybe you just get it for a couple months and you do what you got to do and then you cancel the subscription. You know, you're not locked. It's monthly. It's not yearly. Um, there's also um, Photoshop elements. And on for video, for video, there's Premiere elements. These are simplified versions of Photoshop and Premiere, which are Adobe programs um, that are one fixed price. You only pay for it once, depending on what sales going on. It's usually between 50 and $70. Uh, it's a great program. I, pre I prefer Premiere Elements, which is a video editing software to Premiere because it's really streamlined. It has just the basic, I don't need to do complicated video editing. So it's just very basic. Uh, and sometimes you can get them in a bundle actually for a deal if you are interested in both. And I'll also say that, um, uh, Adobe Bridge is a free program that you can download to your computer. That is a great, uh, so it's basically like your finder or your file uh, viewer on your computer. It is a great way to group images, to look at images, to look at your files, and it's free. It's Adobe program. Uh, and it also allows you to make like contact sheets, you know, like lists of your images with details and stuff like that. So what you're really, you know, the basics of what you would be doing to edit images of your work, brightness, right? That the image appears bright enough. Um, and these are, you know, there are brightness controls, exposure controls that are typically very simple. There are more complicated ones that you can look up tutorials for on uh, YouTube. You know, YouTube is a, obviously a huge help if you're looking for any kind of tutorial on phot photographing, setting up lighting, setting up a shadow, uh, a, a uh, environment to shoot 3D work, um, photo editing stuff. You know, there are other great software that you can pay or, or services where you can pay and get those tutorials, but there's so much free information on YouTube that's really helpful. Um, contrast. Contrast is um, how much difference there is between the lights and the darks. A low contrasted image would appear very grayed out, very minimal contrast. You know, a white piece of paper could appear almost gray next to like a, a black screen of a front of a phone. Um, whereas with a highly contrasted image, this would be starkly white and this would be starkly black on the image. Um, and typically, you know, once you start messing with a contrasting tool in a photo editing software it can start to lose detail. It can start to take gray areas, especially if you're doing like a black and white drawing. If you decided to highly contrast it, you would lose all of the detail. It would just take groups of, of colors and say, well, these are all close enough to the color black. So we're gonna make them all black. And then that would take away the detail and the grays. And tint and warmth, I just say, be really careful if you're gonna mess with the tint or the warmth. Uh, tint is, they're both color space um, controls. So tint is green to pink and warmth is yellow to blue. So if you look at an image and you say, this image appears really blue to me, um, you might go into the warmth and move it towards yellow, but like move it ever so slightly because you'll see, I actually find it sometimes helpful to move it all the way to yellow and then slowly inch it back to get to where I'm supposed to be. And then the same thing for tint. If you see that the image has a cast in one color, you could you could adjust it. Just be careful with it. And um, anytime I'm submitting work samples to something, I like to check it. I have my laptop and then I have an extra monitor that I use or my phone. I like to email it to myself and say, oh, it appears this way on my computer. But then I'll look on my phone and say, see, oh, this looks quite different on my phone because every screen is calibrating, you know, interpreting this information and showing, displaying it differently. So um, I then like to go for something in the middle because whoever's reviewing your work, they might be viewing it on a phone. You don't, you don't know. They might be viewing it on their Mac. They might be viewing it on their PC um, and they're all going to show a little bit differently. So try to find something that sits right in the middle can be helpful. And what you're trying to do is achieve a color correct view of your work and show that your work does not appear dull. Um, and so for 2D work, uh, uh, you know, so you're trying to create an accurate depiction of what your work looks like in real life. For 2D work, you wanna make sure that you are cropping out the background, right? That's a very simple editing thing. There's usually just a crop feature. Um, you can set the constraints of how 
what dimension you want the image to be. You don't want to show any other background for an image. It always is something that gets the comments from uh, panelists or curators. Any questions about some of the stuff I've gone over? Now I'm going to talk about image uh, um, file types. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with the most common image file type, which is JPEG. So it's the most popular, it's the most often used file type, especially for the web. It um, has a range of colors that it can display, uh, but a JPEG image is what we refer to as lossy, meaning that every time you save a JPEG, it is going to stay the exact same file size. No matter what you do to it, it's always going to stay the same file size on your computer. It does this by discarding data that it does not think is important, or um, and I'll explain what that means in a second, discarding data every time the file is saved or every time the file is edited. So if I took a JPEG image into Photoshop and I made a bunch of adjustments, it would, it would make those adjustments and it would save the file, but it would try to keep it the same exact file size that it was originally. So it would keep my edits, but it would also do some things like I was talking about before, where it will say, okay, all of these blues are close enough blues. So let's just make them all the exact same shade of blue instead of a range of blues. And so what that's doing is every time you work with a JPEG file, it is losing detail. It's losing information. Uh, it does not support transparency. You know, if you want it, if you, you know, it would have, if you have an image on a white background, it would either display white or display those little white and gray squares. And so what we use JPEGs for are for sending images by email or posting an image online. And that should be like, you've worked on your image maybe in another file type and you've exported it or saved the final version in a JPEG. And that is what you're gonna send in an email. That's what you're gonna maybe upload to a call for submission or you're gonna post on your website or post on Instagram, right? Um, use it for submitting work to call, use it. You could use it if you were making quick prints, like if you're trying to print something really quickly because it's a, typically a smaller file size the printer will register it quicker. It will take less energy to do it. And it'll just, you know, shoot out an image. I'll give an example of, you know, other file types in a second that would take longer for the computer to process printing it. And also for shooting quick, quick images, say I'm taking, again, snapshots with my family, or I'm just taking some working images really quick. Um, you know, that would all be a JPEG. Um, I don't recommend using JPEGs while you're editing your images, meaning that you, you ed open the same JPEG many times, edit it, save it, open it, edit, save it. It's going to lose detail every time you do that. I don't recommend it for large scale printing, um, although some printers might have a different opinion on that. If they're saying I need it in a JPEG, just do what they're asking. And um, a PN, uh, I wonder why I put this here. Uh, I'll talk about PNGs in a minute. Oh, because I'm sorry, because I accidentally clicked my a button and I moved to the next slide. Um, yeah, do not use for editing your image, making large prints of your work. And if you have a DSLR camera and you have the ability to shoot in RAW, which I'll talk about in a moment, there's no reason to be shooting in JPEG. Okay, uh, GIF. This is another common file type that we see, also PNG. So this is a file type that uses a stark example to JPEGs. They can only reproduce 256 colors. That is not a lot. It is very limited in what it can reproduce. So it is not to be used for reproducing artwork, exporting artwork. Uh, it just has, it's too limited. It's really meant for graphics, things that's like, this is a black and white logo uh, or anything with a very small color palette. It is lossless, meaning it does not lose data when the file is saved, but it retains a very small file size because it uses so few colors. It's a file type that still is in use and it has been in use since 1989. It has never been updated. It's still exactly the same as it's always been. It does support transparency. So that's another use that people use it for if they want to have a 
black and white logo and put it on their website over a background and have it not just have like a square of the whole image size and white, right? That would be a situation to use this file type. It's also used in animation, stop motion animation, uh, not to be used for reproducing artwork, editing your images, printing, and um, just an update. PNG is another file type like this. It was created to replace GIFs, um, but it is still limited in the number of colors it can reproduce. I think it's roughly, it's either double or three times. I can't recall right now, um, but it's not, it's still not good for reproducing artwork. TIFF files. Okay, so TIFF files are my favorite uh, file type. I like using TIFF files um, because I work in photography, so I end up using it a lot. TIFF image files are a lossless format, meaning they do not lose data as you work on them, but that means that the file size gets bigger each time you work on it. The file size is going to get bigger. Um, it can be edited and saved multiple times without losing any data, but the file size is getting bigger, right? Um, if you work in a TIFF file using like Photoshop or Photoshop Elements, it will allow you to save multiple layers of the image. Um, I won't, if anyone has questions about that, I can explain what multiple layers are, but it would basically, you know, that I could have an image of this and I could have an image of this and I could, you know, separately, and then I could put them together like that in the, on the screen. Um, because they're saved as different individual layers that can be placed on top of each other. I like to use TIFF files when I am in process editing an image. I work on it in a TIFF until I am done with it. And then I save it as a JPEG when I'm ready to post it somewhere or send it to somebody. I'm working in TIFF until I'm working in JPEG. This all being said, if you're going to start using more complex uh, image files, they are bigger file sizes and they would require something like an external hard drive, maybe for your computer so that you can save all of this stuff, right? Um, so again, thinking about the whole scope of what you're doing and budgeting, where are you going to store all these images you're working with? Think about that early on before you get a camera that only shoots in, that shoots in raw and you're going to start taking raw images, for example, which are very big file sizes, but then you realize, oh, I, now I need to get a hard drive because I don't have the space to actually store them on my computer, right? And I think I talked to, yeah, so TIFF files, useful editing images, printing images, but if you're going to print an image from a TIFF, it will typically take a long time, um, especially if it has a, a document with multiple images. I remember one time I was trying, I made a photo book in college. I was trying to print. There were two TIFF files that I had missed <laughs> instead of keeping them all JPEG. It was like a 30 page book. And I tried to do a little proof of it and it just was churning and churning and churning and would not submit. And it was just because there were two TIFF files in the file. Uh, so, you know, these can be, can really slow down a printing process. Yeah, Phyllis. Um, I have a question when you said um, that you work in TIFF until you're all done and you put it in a JPEG. Um, does that include like if you're in Photoshop, you're still working in a TIFF file? Is there yeah. an there's an advantage to that over staying in Photoshop? You No, you can definitely, if you're using uh, Photoshop, you can uh, definitely switch to a, um, you can use a Photoshop file. There's no benefit to using a TIFF file. I often use TIFF files for myself because it just happens to be what I like to save in. Um, and uh, it also, um, if you are um, editing in something that is not Photoshop and you can't use that mode, you can use a TIFF file. You know what I mean? Um, oh, but Photoshop okay. works similarly where to a TIFF file where it's not going to, a Photoshop file is not going, it's going to get bigger. It's not going to lose data when you work on it. But that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, so if you were using a different kind of program, the TIFF would take on those characteristics. Yes, yes. Okay. And, um, you know, for myself, and some artists might, actually, I haven't spoken about this, but um, say you have small scale work that can fit on a scanner. Um, I always, I, I still do 35 millimeter too. So I scan my film in TIFF. And I scan, um, you know, if I'm doing a collage, I might just put on a scanner and scan it to get the image. Um, and I would do that in TIFF. And so I'm bringing that file into Photoshop. If you just press save, it's going to create a Photoshop file of it. You could continue to save it in TIFF. Or if I was using a different editing software, TIFF would be a good alternative if they don't have a designated file type. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, TIFFs are not to be used for sending images by, oh, I'll just, sorry, one step backwards. Some of those compact or mirrorless cameras will actually allow you to shoot in TIFF. It's kind of rare, but it does, it is sometimes the case. So if you don't have raw format on your camera, you could try to shoot in TIFF if that's an option and something to look for maybe if you're trying to find a camera. Um, not to be, do not send TIFFs over email. They will be too big more often than not. Um, don't, unless you're specifically asked, they're not to be used for submitting to calls. Um, and as I said before, don't try to print an image or something with a lot of TIFFs at once. It will really slow down your system. And then I'm going to talk about uh, now raw files. So this is the best way. If you have a camera that is able to shoot in raw, as I said before, you want to shoot in raw format um, because it is the best way to have complete control over your image while editing. Um, this contains the most information and allows you to change things about the shooting situation during the editing process. So it literally takes a recording, like a, a really uh, an image that contains so much information that you could actually change the settings on the camera after the fact. Um, it is a huge file size. It requires a DSLR to be able to shoot in RAW, and it requires a processing software that has a RAW processing software like Adobe Photoshop or Lightroom. If you try to open a RAW file on your computer and you don't have a RAW processing software, um, these are built into things like Photoshop and Lightroom it will not, you won't be able to open it on your computer. Um, each camera uses a different file extension for raw files. So if it was on my Nikon, it would be .nef. It wouldn't be like .raw. It will be dependent on the camera. Each, each company, each brand has their own extension. Okay, so some examples here. This is an example of a JPEG versus a TIFF. I um, wish I could zoom in. You'll be able to see this later on. But if you look even in this area, you see the greens here and how bright they are and how similar they are, how much of the same shade of green. And down here, you see that there is more detail. There's more dynamic range. This is a highly contrasted JPEG up here that is losing detail. Like you could really see it down here in the blacks um, because, uh, it's, it's decided we're going to make this image the same size and we're going to lose all the detail down here to keep it the same size here. You down here in the TIFF, you can see more of the gray areas. Here's another example. Um, just really good to show the difference between a JPEG, right? Which has all the colors represented and a GIF which doesn't understand these other colors up here and is creating kind of a strange effect on the image that is grouping colors together and creating new colors basically for the image. All right, any questions on file types? Okay, I know we're over time and uh, I wasn't gonna, I, I keep realizing there's more in here. This is the last kind of technical thing I'm gonna talk about and then it's just final tips. If anyone needs to go, I again, it's being recorded. It will be sent, we'll send it, make it available to you. And uh, we can always chat about these specific things later. But if you're able to hang around, I appreciate it. And that's great. Um, okay, so here's something that I think probably many of us have seen before, right? Is an image specification for what they want for submitting a work sample. So an example of this would be, uh, we want the image resolution to be 100, uh, one, uh, 1920 pixels, 1920 pixels in the longest dimension at 72 PPI, Adobe RGB, save file as an 8-bit eight eight JPEG, and files must not exceed 5 megabytes. What does this mean, right? So uh, I'm going to talk about all these areas, but it is asking you, I think it might be easier. First, I'll, I'll attack the second half of this. If you ever see something saying it must be an 8-bit JPEG, which is less common these days, but still comes up. 8-bit JPEG is standard. If that's what it says, you do not need to do anything to the JPEG. If they're asking for a different color space, this would be a time, like it would be a very unique situation. It might be the case that they, you're submitting to a printed publication and that's why they're asking for it in that format. 
that would be a time to try to call them for help or to do some, you know, just Google what they are asking you or search it in YouTube to try to get an idea of how to adjust that using the software you have on hand. You should not try to adjust for the file size first. If you are meeting their requirements on image resolution, which is the combination of how many pixels long it is, for example, and the pixels per inch, that's what PPI stands for, it should naturally fall within the limit that they've set, okay? Um, so let's talk about image resolution. Digital image resolution is measured in PPI, pixels per inch. It literally means how many pixels are displayed in a square inch on your screen. Um, so 10 PPI, right, extreme examples here. We would never put images in this low of PPI. The standard is 300. 300 pixels per inch. That's what it would take to ensure that it's not a pixelate image. There is sometimes the case where they want really small file sizes. So they're going to say 72 PPI. That's another common. It's usually 72 or 300. Um, so it's literally how many pixels appear within that square inch. So a lower PPI, there are fewer pixels per inch, and you can see the pixels. You can see the squares. As we get even to 40 PPI, you can see it's starting to still show the same image, a, a circle, but it's you still see the pixels, but it's, it's becoming more of what it's meant to be, right? I don't show how to change image resolution in this uh, tutorial because everyone is using a different software and the way you do it is different on each software, but it's typically a drop-down menu that's gonna say, image resolution or image size if you're using photos on Windows or you're using preview on Apple. Um, it's the same thing for photo. And the really quick way to do this is just whatever software you're using, just Google how to adjust image resolution on this. And it will show you a tutorial. Even better if you can watch a YouTube video where they walk you through it. And pay attention to the dates on the those tutorials because these companies change their software all the time and something from 2017 probably won't be relevant anymore, right? Okay. Now, image resizing versus resampling, right? Image resizing is changing the size the image will print without changing the number of pixels in the image. Image resizing is adjusting the image size in inches, okay? Image resampling is adjusting the number of pixels in an image. So that is important for you to know because if you're trying to change the number of pixels, you can. It, it's usually all together, but you might see that term in the dialog in the window. You know, it says resampling, um, and you are adjusting the number of pixels. It's important to size images appropriately for the use because an image with too high a resolution can actually hurt it. You don't want to say like, oh, I want this to be really high quality, so I'm going to make it 800 PPI. You know, that's not going to go over well. Stick to the standard of 300 PPI or 72 if it's a, if it's a lower quality um, image that they're asking for. Pixel dimensions are for the, or for the internet and for digital displays. Document size is for print, but they often, you know, it, it'll say uh, it's this many inches or this many pixels. They view them interchangeably because there's a uh, there's a difference. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer, Casey, your question right now that uh, DPI is dots per inch. That refers to oh, I had it somewhere. Yeah, DPI is dots per inch. That is print image resolution. How many printer dots, ink dots are within an inch? Um, PPI is pixels. It's for digital uh, display. So if I'm saying that I, they're telling me I need an image resolution of 1920, first of all, you wanna make sure that you're adjusting based on the pixel size the pixel dimension, not inches. So there might be a little drop down menu that says inches or pixels. You want to select pixels and then you enter in that number. And often they give it for the long dimension. So then you would say, like, depending on what your longest dimension is, whether it's a vertical or horizontal image, landscape or portrait image, um, what the longest pixel length will be. You also will then adjust 
the PPI, pro most likely in the same box, in the same place, in whatever image software you're using, um, to, you know, now it's this many uh, pixels long, but there will be 72 pixels per inch. So that's it's controlling how big the image is actually going to appear on your screen and how big it would be if you printed it. They are used, they, you know, they correlate to each other and they correlate to each other based on how many pixels are in each inch. So a, um, you know, if I raised, if I took 192 pixel long image at 72 PPI, that image would actually be bigger on my screen than if I did 300 PPI, because then it's fewer, it's more pixels in one, you know, crammed into one inch and the pixel length has not changed. So it's going to appear as a smaller image on my screen just like it would appear smaller if you were to print it. Does anyone have questions about this? And I'm sure you do. And this is the kind of thing that if anybody wants to do a follow-up meeting and chat with me based on their specific image processing software to figure out where that is in your, in your, what the tool that you're using, I'm happy to do that. Okay. There is a free picture uh, converter here, fixpicture.org. Fix you can enter in the exact specifications that you want the image to be, the pixel dimensions, the PPI, and then upload the image there and it will spit out an image that is what you need it to be. And I'll just briefly say, you can get more information on color space. This is again, if you're submitting to a publication, maybe that's gonna print your image. Um, this is uh, there's a tool that will explain this here, but the two common ones are Adobe RGB, which has a wider range of colors, and sRGB, which is standard for the web. This is the standard color space. It, it appears it affects how colors will appear in the image. Um, this can be set in the preferences in your photo editing software. It's going to be in a different place than the resizing. It's typically in your preferences for that image. Again, if you don't know how to adjust color space, Google or look on YouTube, change color space on uh, Photoshop elements, right? And it will, it'll give you a tutorial for the specific tool that you're using. All right, so I'm gonna go over my final tips and then I'll be happy to answer any final questions. So when you're preparing your files for submission, just reiterating some of the stuff I said at the beginning, read the instructions or the guidelines thoroughly. If there is a call asking for a specific file size, image size, you must adhere to that formatting. It's an easy way to get your stuff disqualified, especially if they have a ton of submissions. They'll say, well, you know, this person didn't even submit in a way that we need it to, and it's an easy way to eliminate you. So follow whatever they are asking you to do. Examples of this are submit this many images or upload as a PDF um, or submit a video no longer than this amount of time. Don't mess with that, those kinds of limitations. Stick to what they are asking you to do. Never send excessively large file sizes because that stuff is getting stored in somebody else's email or, you know, wherever it might be. You want to try to send, you know, again, use JPEG to export a final edited photo. Clearly label your files. This is really important. You know, make sure, especially if for some reason they're not letting you give details about your work. You can actually slip that into the file name, you know, um, name of the piece, me dash, medium of the piece, dash 16 by 20. You know what I mean? Uh, inches. That could be a way for you to, to slide that information in, or at least, you know, if they're asking you to label them in a specific way, adhere to that. So there might be something like artist last name and title of the piece. This is especially important if you are, creating a list of the pieces that you are submitting, because then uh, you can use those file names to either they'll be obvious, they'll say, okay, this is the description for this file, um, or you can reference the file name when you're listing them out. You're trying to create a clear and accurate depiction of how your work will look in person using all the tools we talked about today. Um, and so that's the final check for yourself. You know, when you're done and you're ready to submit, does this really look accurate? And like, you know, it's creating an accurate depiction of the work. 
And my last tip really is, you know, check for technical glitches. Do not just expect export your file and attach it um, because, uh, it, you know, so you might upload a export a PDF and it's totally blank. Something was wrong. It was only doing page three or something like that. You never know. So always open the file, check it out. If you can check it out on multiple monitors. Great. But don't just export it and attach it. Yeah, Meg. Yeah, I, this goes back to the lighting. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're if you're shooting um, three dimensional work, ceramics, mm -hmm. for example, do you also recommend the lights be at forty five degree angles at the same level as your camera? That is a simple way to do it for two dimensional work. For right. three dimensional work, you can play around a bit more and get more creative with the lighting. That's a good way to start. And I going back to this, sorry, going back quite a, more than I thought. <laughs> uh, I just want to point it out to you. Yeah, it just oh. took me this long to figure out how to raise my hand. I'm sorry. I thought it was a uh, quicker. It's that uh, place where I provided the link for you mm -hmm. to uh, create an inexpensive. Yes, here it is. Inexpensive yeah. light box. This mm -hmm. shows that you could ways that you could adjust the lighting for using that kind of a setup with a okay. seamless background. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't shot something, a three dimensional piece in some time. I would imagine I would still start with 45 degree equal distant from the camera, but you could also do, um, you know, try to get a more even lighting situation by lighting from the sides uh, and mm -hmm. putting a light at the front. Oh, okay. What about a lighting on top? Um, I like a light box on top, you know, like with a, you know, thing that is, has a uh, diffuser kind of thing on top of it. Light. Again, it's you have a lot more freedom with three dimensional work to to play around with where the lights are and mm -hmm. see what what highlights dynamic points texture. So if if I I that's what's great about a setup like that. If you get a little table set it up and you have your lights and you can easily move them around, mm -hmm. then you can just say, oh, what if I tried it up here? And who knows that might really work for that particular piece. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, I could see that working. I could see a light on top highlighting some some pieces very well. Mm -hmm. um, but you. I could also see it, I would not recommend it being the only light because then it's going to create kind of a top-down spotlight effect. Right, right. And the front won't be lit. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, in order to excuse my scrubbing to get back to where we were. Um, I think I finished this slide talking about technical glitches. Uh, if you want to just send a cold email to galleries about your work, um, you are, you know, I don't think it's unless the website or the curator or whoever specifically tells you not to do that. I don't see the harm in, in doing it. I don't mind it when I get emails um, from, you know, to the, you know, to our gallery email asking about opportunities and sharing their work. I think it's best though to include a link to view your work do not just cold email galleries with attachments of your work because they might not want to receive that stuff. They don't want it stored in their email. So instead, that's a good you know, reason to set up a little website or use an Instagram page or, or some other kind of portfolio website to be able to share your work with them. And I would keep it very, very brief. And you're basically asking, you know, saying, here is some, I, I'm seeking gallery representation or I'm seeking gallery opportunities. Here's a link below to view my work, and I'd like to inquire how you accept submissions. So showing that you are interested in under knowing what they prefer from you. Okay. And I'll one other tip, and I've seen some artists do this to you know varying effect. But if you want to create a book of your work, there are a lot of free tools to do that. I don't recommend making a whole bunch of books and just sending them to galleries. I've worked at multiple galleries where people do that, and they. Honestly, they can end up in the trash because so many would come in. Um, but if you do want to make an artist book, Mad Cloud is a really great um, way to do so. Um, it also enables people to buy them directly from Mad Cloud. You don't have to print all of them. You could be, they can be printed to order. And they have templates in there, or you can design it yourself. And there are many, many websites and services that offer something like this. Mad Cloud is just something I've used a few times and, and happen to like. And the last example I'll show you is of an image description list. So if you were trying to make a, you know, include a detailed list, 
You could do something like Google Sheets or uh, Excel or something like Adobe Bridge or even like a word processor to create a little table, drop the an image of them in, drop the title, the dimension. So everything is really clear. And that is it. Um, again, my name is Lilia Perez. I am the Grants and Programs Manager for Artsmith Hudson. My email is lperez at artsmithhudson.org. And if any of you want to get some feedback on your work samples, I'm offering that to anyone who took this workshop, workshop or talk about the specific camera or software that you're using. Happy to do that. Just send me an email and we can set up an appointment to talk. And thanks for uh, listening in. And I'm going to...